Today we are going to overclock and do some repairs of IBM's first generation PCs. These are all Intel 8088 systems running at 4.77 MHz. They are all overclocked already. But I have a new chip that I think will help us go even faster today. We'll start with the granddaddy of them all, the 5150. This was IBM's first PC released in 1981. From previous attempts, it's now running at 7.5 MHz instead of the original 4.77. We have not tried any faster crystals, so we don't know what the limit is for this machine. Next we'll tackle the 5160XT. It's very similar to the IBM PC, but it has more slots and added support for hard drives. It's now running at 7.5 MHz too. We have not tried any faster crystals yet on this IBM. Then we have the 5155 Portable. It uses the same motherboard as the XT and has a built-in 9-inch display. It originally came with dual floppy drives, but since the motherboard has support for hard drives, the original owner has replaced one of the floppy drives with an MFM drive. It was never sold in this configuration, but this was a very popular upgrade back in the day. This IBM is running at 7.4 MHz. When we try to overclock it to 8.2, the graphics stopped working. We did all the tests with an early black bracket CGA card, because the original Hercules CGA card is broken. We'll try to fix the original graphics card today, and then we'll see if we can go faster with the new mystery chip. Lastly, we have the weird and wonderful PC Junior. This is essentially IBM's first attempt to make a PC for the home market. Although being based on the same Intel 8088, it was actually slightly slower than the original IBM PC. The funny thing here is that this PC Junior is now running at 8.7 MHz, so it's now the fastest of them all. It runs without any issues at 8.2 MHz. At 8.7 it introduces occasional white pixels randomly on the display, but it's still perfectly usable at the speed. Unfortunately, while I was recording the intro, this PC Junior died. When I turn the machine on, it flashes a white display quickly, gives me two beeps, and then nothing more. I'm not sure how much we can cram into this video, but let's just start repairing, upgrading and overclocking, and see how far we can get today. To make this possible, I ordered some PCBs from PCBWay.com. I will put a link in the description below to where you can find the Gerber files for this project. I already have a set of these, but I made a small mistake when ordering the previous batch. I'll show you in a second. And as expected, these PCBs look great. I totally forgot to tick the box for gold when I ordered these PCBs the previous time. So this is my previous batch, and this is the new boards. As you can see, all the pads are plain. That usually doesn't matter, because all of these pads are going to be covered with solder. However, these boards have the Epictronics logo, and it looks so much better in gold. So for my final set of PCBs for this project, I went ahead and reordered these PCBs with gold. Since these boards are tested, I'm gonna go ahead and build up four of these right away. And these are going to be my four keepers. I'm going to try out one of my new short tips for the pine seal today. So the PC Spring project dates all the way back to 1985. It's a simple PCB that disconnects the crystal on the motherboard from the CPU in the original IBM PC, allowing us to use a faster separate crystal to overclock the CPU. The original design was made by a chap called Doug Severson. The user Retro Canada on VCF forums redrew the PCB design for more modern use. A few months ago viewer Vintage Support Service helped me by redesigning the boards again. This time skinny enough to fit not only the IBM 5150, but also the 5155, 5160, the PC Junior and many clones. To make them skinny enough to fit in the 5160, he used surface mount components. 
for this redesign. Oh no, I just realized I only ordered components to build two of these. Well, maybe I'll reuse some components from the previous build. Or perhaps we'll just build two of these today. Well, I don't like waiting for parts. So I gave this a try here. I just placed a large blob of solder on the tip. And then I heat up one side of this diode here. And then the other side. And apparently that's all it takes to remove one of these. So i much rather do this than waiting for more components. So those eight components are diodes. These boards are very clearly marked. So they are quite easy and quick to build. Next we have R2 and R3. And these guys are 10k resistors. If you want to build one of these, I'll put a link in the description to where you can find the Gerber files. And then you can just upload the files to pcbway.com and order your set of PCBs. The link also includes a list of all the components needed. I think I added part numbers to Mauser to make it as easy as possible. And everything except the 8284A chip is still available new. The 8284 chip is easily found on eBay. You only need to order one 8284 chip, because you will be reusing the chip on the motherboard. I'm surprised at how quick and easy it was to reuse some of the components. Next we have R6 and 7. These are 560 ohm resistors. With a big camera on top of these PCBs, I can only see enough to solder one side. I am of course going to solder the other side of all these components. But I'm gonna have to do it off camera in a minute. I'm using 0.38 solder for tiny components like this. But I wonder if I should use even thinner. Yeah, I think I'm gonna order some even thinner solder and try out for the next project. C2, 3 and 5 are 10 microfarad tantalums. Pay attention to the polarity when you solder these guys. It's clearly marked on the PCB. If you make a mistake, it can actually go bang. When soldering tiny components like this, I like to put a tiny blob of solder on the tip. Use a really good flux on the PCB. And then hold down the component with the tweezers. And let that blob do the job. With the help of the flux. Applying a good flux on the PCB is key for this method because as soon as you put that solder on the tip it will burn off the flux inside the solder. We're almost finished actually. So next up we have R1 here. These are 3.3k resistors. And the final component is C1 here. And these guys are 10 nanofarad ceramics. Okay, that was the last component. I will solder the other side of these components off camera. To finish these boards off, we need to install two sockets and some pin headers. And about the new short tip for the pine sill. I have used them for two projects now. And I can't really say it makes much difference. If you have the regular long tips, I really wouldn't upgrade. I kind of thought it would give me more control, but to be honest, it doesn't make much difference. Next we need some right angle pin headers. I have cut them to size, and these are for the turbo and a reset switch. We also need machine pin headers like this. They are for installing the skinny sprint in the socket on the motherboard. They have to be machine pin headers. If you use regular pin headers, they will crush the socket on the motherboard. To be able to solder these nice and straight, I use an old socket. And then I solder the PCB with those pin headers in the sockets. Okay, let's pick some crystals to start with. For the first skinny sprint here, I'm gonna go with a 22.6 MHz crystal. It will be divided by the 8284. 
and give us a speed of 7.5 MHz. This is the fastest speed we know all four IBMs will do. I'm going to solder the crystals raised off the board and then I will cut the legs and solder them correctly when we know how fast all four machines will go. This way it's much easier to replace the crystal. With board number two I'm gonna go with a 24.5 MHz crystal and it will be divided down to 8.16 MHz. On the third board I'm gonna go with a 25 MHz crystal it's going to be divided down to 8.34 MHz. And the last board is going to get a 26 MHz crystal, which should divide down to 8.67 MHz. So pretty small steps. And we've got plenty more if we can go faster. Okay, I'll wash these boards because they're drenched in flux. And then we'll try them out. There is a small issue when overclocking the 5150. If you go for speeds above 7.5 MHz, the floppy drive will stop working. On the XT this is not a real problem, because you would probably run most software from the hard drive. And whenever you need to use the floppy drive, you can just flip the turbo switch at the back on the fly, read the content of the floppy drive, and then flip the switch at the back again for full speed. But the 5150 doesn't have a hard drive, and my machine doesn't have an XT ID either. So I'm going to use a real hard drive for this test. However, this is a very early machine. Its serial number is 350,000 something. It even came with two early black bracket cards that I'm not using at the moment. That also means that it has the first version of the BIOS, without support for hard drives. So before we can continue, we have to upgrade the BIOS to the newest version. An added benefit to upgrading the BIOS is that we can install 640k of RAM. The first revision of the BIOS only supports 544k of RAM. So I have actually planned for this upgrade for that reason alone. The BIOS in the 5150 is in U33 here. So let's pull that chip. I'm going to use some deoxid before I install the new BIOS chip. I actually have an original chip, but if you don't, you can find and download the contents on minus zero degrees and make your own BIOS chip. This new BIOS also adds support for VGA and EGA cards. Upgrading the BIOS on these early boards also means that you need to check switch block 2 and switch 5. Depending on how much RAM you have, you need to make sure it's set correctly. In my case, it needs to be set to ON. Okay, big old hard drive, controller and power supply installed from an XT. This drive has not been paired with this controller here, so we need to run Speedstore. Oh wow, that is a noisy power supply. So we need to low level format this drive here to pair it with a controller. An easy way to do this is to use speed store. I'm just going to use manual setup. And you can't see this, but here's our hard drive, so it's recognized by the software. And I'm just going to choose initialize. I have already checked that drive, so I know interleave 5 is the best choice. This is going to take a couple of minutes, so I'll skip ahead here. The proper way to do this, if you're looking for a permanent solution, is of course to use an XT IDE. But I just want to test this board and see how fast it will go today. And I still haven't finished my XT ID project. So my card is actually still half finished. Okay, a couple of minutes went by and it's complete. So now we can quit. Exit to DOS. Um, I got a divide overflow. I'm not sure what that's all about. So I'll reboot to DOS on a floppy. Well, that didn't go too well. I tried with four different floppies. Now, that is pretty cool actually. I pulled out the cleaning floppy that is still unused from the 80s. And the IPA has actually survived. 
So this cleaning disc is still wet after all those years. So that's pretty remarkable. I guess we don't need to add fresh IPA. I'll run that cleaning disc a few times. Okay, that should be enough. If that was our issue. Well, that didn't help. So <laughs> I guess I have a bad drive to repair in a future video. Well, I moved the cable to drive B. But I'm getting that divide overflow again. So we have a bigger issue than the bad floppy drive. Okay, I found a problem. So the machine now boots from drive B. I was running what a 22.6 megahertz crystal and apparently that's too much. So I lowered to 22.11. The tiniest difference. But apparently that's the limit for the floppy drive on the 5150. Okay, drive A is now working too. So no repair video. The broken floppy drive. Well, I do have those too, so perhaps. But for now, let's run FDisk. And create a primary DOS partition. And now we can format the C drive. And now we can copy check it to the C drive. So we can run the benchmarks without using the floppy drive. Now let's do a quick test before we start overclocking. Okay, finally, everything is working. And we are running at 7.37 megahertz. Well, we already know that 7.5 megahertz works. So let's go for 8.16. By the way, I'm setting these to constant turbo mode with the jumper. Okay, fingers crossed. Man, that power supply is so noisy. Oh no, I'm getting nothing on the display. And that brings us to the mystery chip. I had a look in the datasheet for the 8284A. Now check this out. The 8284 is only rated for 8 MHz. Luckily they also made a Dash 1 version, rated for 10 MHz. So this might be the reason we can't run the board at 8.16 MHz. Well, in that case, let's install it in U2. Okay, 5150, last chance to go beyond 7.5 megahertz. Oh no! It just won't boot. So there is something else on this board that just can't run beyond 7.5 megahertz. By the way, all four machines have 10 megahertz V20s. So that is not the issue. Well, in that case, there is no point in running the 22.6 MHz crystal. It's much better to lower it to 22.11 and have working floppy drives. The difference is absolutely tiny. Oh no! That is a bad chip. I decided to switch to a slower crystal. And it still won't boot. So that eBay seller sold me a bad chip. Oh, that sucks. That thing was expensive. Let's scrub that thing down with some acetone. Oh yeah, that text came right off. That is not an 8284A. That is just some random chip that he had rebadged. Well, I took a break here and did some anger management. What a disappointment. That chip was obviously meant to be sort of the main attraction of this video. I don't get it. How are these guys getting away with this? Well, there's no point in trying to overclock the XT today. I will of course order new chips and try again. But for now, let's try to do the best of this video and see if we can repair that graphics card that came with the IBM 5155. I order stuff for my videos months ahead of time, so it's too late to make a claim on eBay. Now over to this card here. This is actually a rather unusual card. It's a Hercules card, but it's not for Hercules graphics. 
This is a very compact card for CGA graphics. The 5155 doesn't display any color graphics on the display. So one would think it has MDA graphics, but it actually doesn't. That tiny little amber display is actually showing CGA graphics. I don't know if this card was installed from factory, or if this is an upgrade. It may have been installed when the previous owner installed the MFM drive. Well, in either way, this graphics card is broken. I have replaced the two caps down here, but unfortunately that wasn't the problem. I'm gonna place my bets on these two guys here. This is the VRAM on this card, and these are Texas TMS 4416. Let's put these guys in sockets and see if I'm right. Well, this card actually has IBM numbers at the back here, so this card was most likely installed by IBM. The original IBM EGA card is using the same chips, so I've got tested good chips to test with. Unfortunately, a lot of these chips aren't made anymore, so we have to rely on eBayers. And in most cases, they are honest people. But apparently not all of them. The IBM EJ expansion card project is delayed too. Because of bad chips. So I'm waiting for a new batch to come in. I think six of the chips were bad. And several more chips were marginal. But that could just be because of age. So I'm not gonna get too upset over that batch of chips. But that 8284 was clearly a fake. That seller deliberately rebadged wrong chip. I mean, that must be illegal, so I don't get it. How are they getting away with that? I only ordered one chip. Because they were quite expensive. So I wanted to try it out before I ordered more. So perhaps I was lucky. I could have lost a lot more money if I had ordered four of those. Most of these pins cleared out right away. But not quite all of them. So I'll add some fresh solder to the stubborn pins. Yeah, that totally worked. I'm not going to use any force. I'm just going to gently pull on these chips and see if they are loose. And they're not. So some of these pins are still stuck. I'll heat the pads from this side of the board. If I'm lucky, it's just going to fall out. Well, not quite that easy. I had to push slightly on the pins. And here are our two suspect chips. Well, those through holes cleared out very easily. So we can just install two sockets right away. I'll solder one pin on each side, roughly in the middle of the socket. And then I'll check and make sure that both sockets sit flush. And they do. So now we can solder the remaining pins. I'll be an optimist and clean that board up right away. Okay, nice and clean. And ready for a test. I'm gonna test this board with the chips from the IBM EGA card. Because they are freshly tested. If this works, I will replace them with new chips. Wow, these chips were manufactured just 9 weeks after the original chips from this board. Presumably in the same factory. So, are these gonna go bad too? Or perhaps my guess was wrong. I'll use the XT to test the card. Because it's so much easier. Disassembling the 5155 is quite a project. And that thing is tiny compared to the original card. I'm using an AST3G card in this machine at the moment. So I need to check the switches. No, they were actually set correctly for CJ graphics. So, why did it work with this card? This is an EGA card with its own ROM. So I actually had the switches incorrectly set. 
and yet it worked just fine. Okay, let's see if we have better luck with this card than what we had with that chip. Yeah, that is looking good. It's counting up the RAM. Oh, graphics mode not available, of course. I uh, had it set for EGA graphics. So let's change to those nasty CGA graphics. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, that totally works. Okay, let's have a look at the PC Junior next. So we have actually repaired this machine three times so far. First it had glitchy graphics. That turned out to be leaky caps in the display. So that's fixed. Then we had a bad RAM chip on the expansion card. And the third time, one of the RAM chips on the motherboard went bad. So this PC Junior keeps me busy. When one of the RAM chips on the motherboard went bad, we still had a normal post screen, but it showed only 4K of RAM. However, when the chip went bad on the expansion card, we had two angry beeps and a black screen, just like we have now. So I think this is a RAM issue again. The expansion card isn't installed, obviously. And apparently it's missing all its chips, so I need to find those. That means it has to be one of these eight chips on the motherboard here. If the two angry beeps and the black screen is in fact a sign of bad RAM chips. Since we had to do the repair. These RAM chips are all in sockets now. So this should be an easy test. I have some spare chips, but I'm not going to use them. Instead, I'm going to borrow a few chips from this RAM expansion card from the 5150 because these are freshly tested. Or at least I think they are. I don't really know how good of a test the 5150 does of the RAM, especially on the expansion card. It may just do a very simple test, or no test at all. As I mentioned before, that 5150 is a pretty early machine. So the original chips on this expansion card are these gold top ceramics manufactured in 1982. I think all these modern chips here is my doing. Filling up a card like this with RAM chips back in 1982 must have cost a fortune. So the original owner only went for two banks. I could really use a good RAM tester. I have done some reading. But so far, none of them seem to be really good. So perhaps it's a difficult thing to create a tester for these old RAM chips. This card has parity, so we can leave one of the chips in. Okay, all the RAM chips are installed. Let's put that funky power supply back in. Okay, let's flip that switch and see what happens. Well, it flashed a white screen, two angry beeps, and then nothing. So that didn't make a difference, unfortunately. Okay, in that case, let's pull that drive out and have a look underneath. Maybe I forgot to connect something when I worked on this machine the last time. That has happened before. Well, we have an original 8088 installed and an 8284. So I have removed the skinny sprint. Maybe I needed it to test some other machine. Well, I have not powered this machine up with these chips installed. So I think that's the next step. And the CPU apparently is the original chip from the 5160. Well, I guess we can install the original CPU and the 8284 that came with this machine. Since they are tested and working chips. Oh, hang on a minute. That socket was a bit loose. So is this our issue? There was pretty much no resistance at all when I installed this chip. Let me try that again. Well, I'm not sure, but this is definitely a suspect. Okay, let's turn the machine on and see what happens. Okay, still two angry beeps and a black screen. I've had some issues with machine sockets over the years. So let's try with the CPU that has much longer legs. And test again. No, same behavior. 
How about if I push on 8284 while we boot? No, same issue. Well, I don't trust the socket here. It feels really flimsy, but the skinny sprint has much thicker legs. So let's try with the skinny sprint installed. I'm running it at normal speed now, since I have an original CPU installed. Uh, that's interesting. That gave us a white screen. And no beeps. Oh, right. That is a fake chip. I forgot to replace it. Okay, that's fixed now. Let's try again. No, that wasn't the issue. Okay, I had a look on Google. And those two beeps are a possible RAM failure. Another option is a bad 8253. So let's pull that motherboard and find out. Okay, so this guy here is an Intel 8253 programmable interval timer. And unfortunately it's not in a socket. And the guy who wrote that post, by the way, is actually one of the guys who signed the case on this piece of junior. So that's quite a coincidence. I wrote an email to the guy who sold me that fake chip, by the way. He wrote back that they were untested. And he seems to be willing to sort things out. Even though it's too late for me to file a claim on eBay. So maybe he bought them a good faith too. I guess I'll ask him to wipe all those chips down with acetone before he sells any more of those. I checked on eBay and these timer chips are still available. So if this is our problem, this is fixable. A few stubborn pins, but not too many, but they are all bent. So I need to make sure to get them all unbent before we try to pull that chip. Otherwise we're gonna rip one of those pads off. Well, this is almost impossible to get on camera. But let me try. This is a lot worse than bent pins. These chip legs have been cut off during manufacturing to make them shorter. However, the piece that has been cut off is still left on some of these pins forming sort of a hook. So if we try to pull this chip now, it will definitely rip those pads off. This is going to be too difficult to do on camera, but I'm gonna try and use my side cutters and try to snip these hooks off before I try to pull that chip. Okay, I think that's good enough. So let's heat up those pads from this side of the board to get all of those pins unstuck from the through holes. No, that is taking too long. I'll heat the entire board up with a heat gun and then we'll try again. Okay, board is just about too hot to touch. So that thick ground plane is now nice and toasty. Let's try again. I'm obviously skipping ahead here, but it is moving. And it's very, very slowly coming off the board. I'm not using any force, I'm just very gently pushing on those pins. But this chip here is unusually stubborn. Well, it's almost off the board, but not quite. Yeah, it's still stuck. So we're gonna have to heat on this side of the board too. Yeah, it's moving. This is working. Come on, you little chip. Don't be stubborn. There you go. Okay. All the pads look fine on this side. Um, this side too. So we're all good. Okay, so we're gonna need a 24 pin socket. Luckily, I mess around with Commodore 64. So I've got plenty of these. All the through holes cleared out really well. So we can go ahead and install the socket right away. Uh, the only thing left to do is to solder that socket. I'll skip ahead here. Okay, socket soldered and board cleaned up. 
I'm ready for a test. I looked through all my stuff, but I couldn't find a chip in a socket. But I found this loose XT board. This board is untested, so not ideal. But it's extremely unlikely that this chip is bad too. So let's use it. Okay, chip removed and socket installed in the XT board. This board is for another video. Now let's install this chip here in the PC Junior. The pins are a bit short on this chip, but I managed to clean them up reasonably well. So hopefully it will make good contact in that socket. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see if this helped. Yes! <laughs> that fixed it! Oh, uh, hang on. No, now we got a black screen. What's going on? We just had IBM splash screen. Let's try that again. Yeah, here it is. And with 64k of RAM. But after the post, it just goes black. Well, maybe that's normal when we have the floppy disconnected. I haven't messed around much with this machine yet. So, floppy installed on the board. Let's try again. Okay, we got a splash screen. 64k of RAM. It's trying to read from the floppy drive. Isn't this thing supposed to go to basic? Huh. Let me try with the floppy disk. Okay, let's try exploring PC Junior and boots and posts. Uh, now we have a cursor and it's reading from the floppy and it boots. Okay, colors are messed up. I think this is supposed to be blue. Wow, that is loud. Okay, so I think it's working, but I'm not sure because I thought it was supposed to go to basic when it doesn't have a floppy in the drive. I'm such a noob when it comes to the junior. Maybe it requires a cartridge for basic. I can't quite remember. Well, now it boots to basic. I tried to boot from this floppy here. Your PC Junior sampler. I can't quite remember what this is. Let's try to boot without the floppy. Okay, so now we have basic. Well, maybe it had to wake up from a long sleep. I need to bring out this PC Junior more often. So, a dead timer chip. And this PC Junior is now fixed again. Thanks to an old post online by one of the volunteers at Computer Reset. Thanks if you're watching this. Well, the PC Junior was never designed to take more than, I think, 256k of RAM, sidecar included. So next up in this project, we are going to hack it to take 640k. We are of course going to do so the old school way. If you're watching this in the future, there will be a link to that video on the screen shortly. Same thing with that fake 8284 chip. If I can find a working chip, that is. If you're watching this fresh, hit the bell icon below and set it to all. I will end by saying thank you to my patrons. I appreciate your support. And now is a good time to watch this video. If you want to support me too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get ad-free early access. If you like this video, let me know with a thumbs up and a comment. If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Now, how am I gonna come up with the title for this incredibly messy video?